Okay, so welcome to my free lecture for teachers and parents in the back to school season. Today we are going to be talking about staying safe throughout the new guidelines of the pandemic. So both ways that you can support your own and your household's innate and acquired immune system, also supporting against toxicity with potential hazards of disinfectant products. We'll be identifying a lot of actionable items and some direct recommendations, as well as some suggestions on lifestyle strategy and diet, product recommendations and supplement strategy and so much more. So we're gonna be unpacking managing and supporting your immune system, working with metabolic health and stress support. It's gonna be about an hour in length. Um, I tend to be a high powered hose and I can share a lot in that information. Um, I will be providing you guys some summary notes at the end, so stay tuned for that. Those of you that registered through the link and um, I will find a way to get the notes up on my blog or something for the rest of you that didn't have that link registration. Um, so just enjoy the ride and I will be uploading also the archive on YouTube. So without further ado, I wanna welcome my guest who is going to be interviewing me. Um, and this is Ms. Lindy. Um, do you wanna share with listeners just a little bit about your background and then we'll jump into things. Sure. Well, I'm a teacher. I teach in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm the wife of a fireman. That kind of got me started down this path. Um, three years ago, we lost a firefighter in our area, and it was a very big wake-up call to me as a woman who was nearing 260 pounds. I was very ill a lot of the time, that if in a moment my husband would pass away, it's just me. I need to be um, healthier. I need to be my best that I can be. So I decided to go down the path of keto. I found a lot of resources, including Allie. Um, I think my first experience with you, Allie, was at Low Carb Houston. And okay, yeah. I just almost fell out of my seat. <laughs> the, um, my immediate reaction was informational density. It just was <laughs> so much and so awesome. And I had to learn the Allie lingo and I'm hooked, I'm hooked. So this is amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Really, really, it's so highly appreciated. Awesome. And so for those of you guys that are new to me, I am a registered dietitian, uh, but my background is in naturopathic medicine. So I balance the worlds of conventional allopathic with the naturopathic functional medicine world. And um, I have a clinic that's virtual and was virtual before all the things um, where I work with patients actually around the world. I have patients in a couple different countries now. And um, a lot of my focus is on managing what's called the HPA axis, which is our hypothalamic pituitary adrenals, which is a lot of big words, but basically it's how our body manages the fight or flight response and chronic stress. And a lot of my philosophies come down to the idea that many humans, even preceding the pandemic and all the stress that has come from this, most humans are now wired in a survival fight or flight mode and the body does not perceive safety. And when the body does not feel safe based on mental stress, based on maybe gut bacteria overgrowth, based on maybe influence of mold toxicity in the household and so many other impacts, then the body does not have optimal regulation. And this can be regulation of the immune system, regulation of metabolism, regulation of sleep cycles, sexual hormone, and so much more. So I have a couple different resources in the forms of books. Um, Naturally Nourished is the first book I put out in 2015. That's a cookbook. And that does have keto-friendly recipes in there. Um, the next book I put out is called The Anti-Anxiety Diet, and that's a nonfiction read. And then last fall, I came out with The Anti-Anxiety Diet Cookbook, which provides 80 plus gut healing, keto-friendly recipes recipes. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about my background. We're going to keep things light and fun, a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that are joining us on the live platform on Zoom. Um, if you have questions, um, I would really like you to use the Q&A box instead of the chat. Um, and so the Q&A box is a way where I will be able to, after this um, class, be able to download your questions and actually provide helpful links and resources so that I can provide that as a resource for you guys. And also that's where Lindy will be able to get a clear kind of organized <laughs> 
flow of your questions. And then at the end, I will answer those that I did not address in my flow. So here we go. Um, yeah, let's do it. All right. So the, one of the things I messaged you about, you know, during all of this was the fact that you help calm my fears. Can you help kind of bring us in, talk to us about the true risk factors that we are facing? Help us calm our fears here, Allie. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a big issue right now with what's going on is information overload and a lot of um, sensationalism uh, that we see in the media. And if if we um, just take a pause and think of the conversation of how often COVID is said or pandemic or how everything was discussed on the death toll for so long, and then after April really transitioned to caseload, um, we have to be mindful and, and pause and, and think about sensationalism and how sensationalism sells and how the media often grabs on to drama and this kind of doomsday gloom can really sell media um, and can really create addictive watching and more viewership. And that's where we get a lot of sensationalism. So the data that I always am sharing on my Instagram at Ali Miller RD is always through cdc.gov. You know, that's really where we're getting the tightest statistics. And when we look at the up-to-date case fatality rate, which looks at the amount of people that have been infected over those that have uh, died from the infection itself, we're looking at a 0.26% infection fatality rate or case fatality rate. So the other way of saying that would be that there is a 99.73% of survivalhood of this current pandemic. That's not to say that, you know, it is a novel virus, which means we're learning more about it every day. Um, but the amount of testing that we're doing when we're talking about cases rising in Florida or Texas or you name it, we've never tested like we are testing for this said virus. You know, we never had basketball players test for influenza. If they had a fever and they were vomiting, they didn't play that game, period. <laughs> you know, we didn't check and proactively test, and we're seeing higher than 35% asymptomatic carriers now. So this will influence the numbers. And when we're thinking of quantitative information, um, that can often be skewed to pick the highest sensational information. And, and what I mean by that is if we're looking at any data and, and, and off the front, this whole conversation is to be to be informative and empowering and not to take any political position or anything as far as any personal gains by any means. But just in the constructs of, you know, things like mask research or, or research on risk factor, um, when you see on a commercial, uh, we see like YouTube commercials and such are saying, you know, somewhere between 80 to 85% reduced transmission with use of masks. The research study that they're pulling that number 85% from was through Lancet Journal. And uh, that particular study, they had, let me pull, because I do have to look at the numbers here. So they had looked at 172 studies. It was a review. So this was not a double blind randomized controlled trial. They reviewed 172 studies. They thinned out 29 studies that were unadjusted. They took an additional 10, so 39 total studies. And they, of those 10 studies, they adjusted the information in there. And so of the 172 studies, they're using 39 studies to come up with a conclusion. And for those of you that are familiar with the saturated fat hypothesis or mm -hmm. are familiar with understanding how correlation is not causation, when we look at epidemiology and research, when we're tying things like red meat kills and a lot of misinformation that can influence policy, we have to always take pause and look at where the number's coming from and what's being extrapolated and, and can that manipulate messaging. Um, and so when you look at a total of 172 and only 39 are looked at, you know, we're looking at less than an eighth of the amount of information available. And then from that information, trying to make a correlation or trend, they did see of those 39 studies, they were able to find 3% transmission for people that were wearing a mask and 17% transmission without mask wearing. But this was only in reviews of a healthcare setting and the certainty was stated as low at best. So truly it's a 3% versus 17%. So you could say a 14% variance, but when you take that division, you can find an 85%
variants and that's the message that's given. So we just have to always read beyond the headlines. And, and again, I'm not stating in, in this video in any sense, any positioning on masking. I'm just stating that when you hear the word 85%, it looks stronger than when you really go behind that headline and you look at the true numbers of how they got there in the first place. So we do have to be mindful in that when we see a lot of the messaging and sensationalism. In the world of children, we know that there was YMCAs that were open throughout even the peak of pandemic, even in epicenters like New York City. Um, and there were 40,000 plus children and essential workers that were serving populations during this time. Um, there were no cases of, of infection outbreak. Um, and we've also heard from the World Health Organization scientists Dr. Sawamon, uh, she says, children are less capable of spreading it even if they get the infection and certainly are at low risk of getting ill from the disease. Um, there have not been many cases described of children transmitting the pandemic to others, particularly within the school setting. So just to kind of calm the ease again, 99.73% survival, a lot of asymptomatic carriers within here, um, and uh, a lot of times the headlines can sensationalize the data that exists. Absolutely, absolutely. So within functional medicine, you address root cause of chronic conditions. Can you help us really understand what's happening in our bodies with COVID? Yeah. So when we're looking at COVID, first off, even within the data, it's important to note that there's a huge fluctuation of risk factor associated with age, you know? Um, we see that with age, um, any form of disease state is going to be exacerbated because there's low nutrition status with the elderly population. Many of them are low vitamin D. Many of them have sarcopenia or muscle wasting, which will influence the immune system. And many of them have polypharmacy, which is five plus drugs. And that's 40% of Americans in the age group of 70 plus are on five plus drugs. So this creates what's called iatrogenic complications where we can have drug influence, where drugs can drive inflammation or hinder liver and kidney function and, and can create more advanced progression of disease than would be in a younger, healthier population. We also see for risk factors comorbidity. And I just want to call that out too before we go into kind of mechanisms. Um, we've seen 86% of individuals um, that have died from COVID of having comorbidities, um, which include hypertension to be the, the top one as a risk factor, followed by diabetes, and then followed by heart disease. And all of these have that umbrella risk factor of obesity. So we'll start to talk about how weight loss would be a really successful way of supporting optimal immune and metabolic health. Um, and then vitamin D is another area that we see a strong trend of risk factor right away. Um, upwards of 88% hospitalized having insufficient, um, and that's less than 30 NGs per ml as their blood level. And then we see 98.9, almost 99% of the population that was hospitalized with severe complications having a level less than 20. Um, and so really we see most severity, or that was of the death, excuse me. Um, um, and so we do see severity with vitamin D and comorbidity. So when we're talking about how this occurs, um, it is a respiratory condition. And so it enters the respiratory tract. Um, if infected, the virus is going to bind to our ACE2 receptors and enter the cell and then kill that cell. And these virons escape from that dead cell and they start to infect new cells. Um, and so there is an inflammatory process that the body is going to upregulate trying to combat this viral spread, if you will. And this is where we can see things like the cytokine storm that we may have heard of in the media or you know, through various programs. And cytokines are an inflammatory chemical that our body makes to try to defend or to basically block something that's going on that's, that's inappropriate in the body. 
But when not managed, and we see, for instance, vitamin D is something that's able to regulate cytokine in the body. And so if someone has an inflammatory condition already and is dealing with obesity, where we see inflammation to be at a higher risk factor, then their cytokine storm can get out of hand and isn't going to be regulated or counteracted as much as someone with an anti-inflammatory diet or someone that has that optimal vitamin D status. And that's what causes the risk factor to damage in the vessels. There is clotting factors um, that can play a role with this, which is where we're seeing some of the delayed complications, um, which can create da damage to the lungs and other tissues. And this can be for two reasons, both from that inflammatory viral activity, but also from the debris. Once your immune system engages and identifies that there is a pathogen, whether that's bacteria or viral, your immune system starts to go into battle mode. And again, that's where it's gonna upregulate your white blood cells. We're gonna see those inflammatory mediators. This is where a lot of people get a fever is a marker of inflammation, heat in the body, right? And that's a way of your body trying to battle this invader. During that battling process, your body is going to kill some of that virus and that's also going to shed cells. And then we can get a lot of what's called endotoxins. And so this is like the debris that would create a lot of like the body aches that can reside or like chronic fatigue syndrome and muscle aches. Um, yeah. So, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> I'm actually just thinking about like not those who are not fevering, what kind, why would some people fever and not fever as far as that goes? Is there anything to that? Or do we know anything more about why certain, um, you know, uh, what do you call them? Symptoms arise in some people while they don't arise in others. Is there anything on that? Or I, I think it's just based on, you know, the unique individual's immune system and how it responds. It also is influenced by the viral load, um, you know, so the level of infection rate. Um, and, and so, I mean, on a functional approach, you think of all of the, the influencing factors and then you go back to the root cause. So the first thing you can do is to support a robust immune system. And your immune system has two parts of it. It has the innate or the um, immediate response, which requires like barriers. Um, and so barriers are through our skin, through our mucus, that's a barrier. So us actually, when we're sick, sneezing and our immune system producing more mucus and phlegm to gather the pathogen to carry it out. That is an innate mechanism of the immune system. And a fever would be an innate mechanism of the immune system. So it requires a robust immune system, a healthy immune system to identify something's not right and start to create that type of a process. And then the acquired immune system is going to be the learned immune system. And this is what requires like our T cells, um, our influence from our antigen and antibody where the immune system starts to build tagging relationship to say, oh, I know what that is. And now we know how to fight it. Um, and this is where we start to see when we're looking at the mechanisms of vaccine or herd immunity, that learned immunity function of the body understanding what this is and, and knowing what to do with it. But the two ways you can really support a robust immune system are based on the microbiome and also having optimal micronutrient support. So we'll talk about in a moment, like tools and steps, but that's the first thing I always ensure. Do you have good micronutrient status and do you have good microbiome support, good probacteria in your gut? Because probiotics actually play a role in both the innate and the acquired mechanisms of your immune system. Um, because it is a um, oxidative stressor on the body and we have that issue of clotting factor, antioxidant status is huge. In fact, we've seen um, some clinics using IV therapy of vitamin C and glutathione. Um, glutathione is the master antioxidant. And we've even seen in studies that those that have low endogenous, meaning cellular levels of glutathione to have more severity of complications. So supporting oxidative stress with antioxidants would be another thing we'd look at with, with the um, functional approach. The third thing that we would look at is supporting inflammation via anti-inflammatory approaches of eating and maybe even supplementing with anti-inflammatory compounds. So we'll cover that today as well. And then the fourth mechanism as far as functional approaches go is to support the detoxification system. So the liver, the kidneys, and the colon 
because that's what's going to aid in releasing the debris or those endotoxins from the die off from the pathogen. Um, and that's going to ensure that then you're less prone towards some of those clotting factors and that residual effect of the aches and fatigue. Now you've got more specifics on the immune system and how to actually go about um, testing maybe to see, are, is there a way for us as teachers or parents to see you know, what our status is um, and then to attack from there? Yeah, so I mean, there's basic labs that you can look at um, and you can advocate and ask even your general practitioner for these and I'll put a list in my summary notes for you guys. Um, I mean, most definitely we know that there's a pandemic within a pandemic just stating that there's 86% of the individuals that are having severity of complications having comorbidities. And so we know if we can manage metabolic health, and that's again, hitting high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease, as well as obesity, the overarching pandemic um, in this, we know that then we can really support more resilience, not just for COVID, but for future pathogens. Because, you know, the buck doesn't just stop there. We're looking at for our entire life, how to be resilient. And we also, like you said, Lindy, can experience, of course, the beauty when we're managing metabolic health, we can experience better quality of life. We can experience better mood. We can experience better libido. We can experience, you know, improved body composition and confidence and so much greater. Um, and so that is the beauty of when you start to layer in some of these um, influences. But to really understand your risk factor, I think that you need to at least know what your hemoglobin A1C is. So this is your three month average of your blood sugar levels. Um, I also would look into your fasting insulin. This is gonna be also a marker of how taxed your blood sugar regulation is. I am wearing a CGM right now. So this is so a, jealous. <laughs> this is the continuous glucose monitor. And so this is actually monitoring my blood sugar for two weeks for 24 hours. And this is really the best information you can get because you can see how exercise influences your blood sugar. You can see how particular things you eat influences your blood sugar, your sleep patterns, your stress levels, and so much more. But to start, an A1C and fasting insulin is a great starting point of knowing where your blood sugar is and your diabetic risk. I would also encourage requesting a um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So that's HSCRP. Um, this is a marker of your inflammation in your body. So you know if you have a risk factor for those clotting factors or if your body is going to be able to manage those inflammatory cascades that the virus can cause. And I really recommend ideal functional level is less than 0.8. Um, but if you are above a 1.5 in, in your CRP, definitely bringing in some anti-inflammatory support would be important. Um, vitamin D is another one, of course, as I mentioned. Yeah. And so I like values 50 to 100 um, of NGs per ml. Um, again, we already talked about those risk factor associations as that value gets down. And just with the pandemic, I recommend a semi-annual twice a year vitamin D check. Um, you can also, if your doctor won't order these, I will put them in just for, I know a lot of people are signed up for this. I'll put these into a just cash that you can order online lab panel, these six things. And that's an option for you guys as well. Um, but vitamin D, you can even go to like any lab test now and request yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the last two that are a little bit more nerdy are um, GGT or, or you can look at your serum glutathione. So GGT looks at liver toxicity. Um, and glutathione levels are looking at that master antioxidant. And then you could look at a red blood cell, selenium and zinc. These two minerals are some of the more important minerals we're seeing to reduce the viral influence and can even stop viral replication. Awesome. That would be an amazing thing to have a link to be able to go and just get those tested and to know for sure yeah. what pathway we need to go down as far as helping us. But when we're talking about those, you know, comorbidities and how how can we attack what are like your top three um, things that teachers, listeners um, could do to support their health outcomes if um, or to reduce their risk of getting it, but also if they do the severity if they do get COVID. Yeah. So on 
I, I think it all starts again with metabolic health. And so it's, it's actually in an acute, meaning short-term, as well as a chronic factor that metabolic health matters. So just we've seen in research that just a high influx of sugar at one sitting can literally take your white blood cells off target and can reduce the white blood cell, which is your first innate army of defense after you are infected or after that virus has gone into the respiratory tract, right? Of your immune system to be able to go into overdrive mode or go into reactive mode. So we see that sugar and blood sugar spikes can play a huge role on taking your immune system off guard. That's not something that we want to be doing during this time at all. Yeah, you're and saying, so don't stress eat on the sugary, carby things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe we'll talk about what you like. I don't recommend stress eating, period. But if you're having salty, crunchy pork rinds, you know, if you're having, we can troubleshoot that maybe at the end. Um, but yeah, so I mean, watching carb control is really important. And so again, both the acute short-term influx of, of sugar can take your immune system off guard for a period of time. And we see that you can actually reduce your fasting insulin level in as short as nine days. So just over a week's time of carb control, your body can make metabolic change. And again, that hemoglobin A1C is a three month average. And so we can start to see week by week trimming away at how coated in sugar your red blood cells are. That's what that A1C measures. Um, so I would recommend a lower carbohydrate diet. Um, I would say a max of 75 grams of carbs per day. Um, and so for those of you that aren't familiar with carb exchanges, you could track on a MyFitnessPal would be a great thing or any of those free apps um, and just start with that goal of keeping your carbs at 75 or less a day. And that would mean that all meals would cap at like 30 grams max a meal. And then maybe you would do a carb free meal or something like that. Um, and I'll walk through in a moment an example day of intake so you can kind of see this all kind of flushing out. Nice. So, so um, yeah, 75 grams of carbs a day would be one big thing. And then including protein at all of your meals and healthy fats would be really essential. The carbs are not essential. Protein and healthy fats are for brain health, for immune health, for muscle mass, and so much more. Um, the second thing that I would say to be proactive is taking a multivitamin um, um, that has chelated minerals. And so um, this is really important to ensure that we're getting that selenium and zinc as featured minerals in a multivitamin. Um, I have one in my line called multi-defense. And um, this does also have a blend of antioxidants. It actually has a tested ORAC score, which is its antioxidant capacity. And so it has phyto compounds from things like green tea and pomegranate and other well-researched botanicals that reduce that oxidative stress. And that's all within that multivitamin tablet. You're also getting methylated B vitamins and such. And so this would be a really good insurance policy while you're still working on a clean eating diet. And the third goal for being proactive would be having a probiotic food daily. Um, so you could have like a full fat Greek yogurt where you'd want to do unsweetened and add if you need, as you're adjusting your palate, I'm all about channeling savory to keep it low carb and not replace with diet products, but start to appreciate the natural sweetness in foods. And so doing a plain full fat Greek yogurt, Greek is important for the higher protein. This type of yogurt will be strained and concentrated in protein. And then with your palate, you could add a little bit of um, farmer's market wild honey, uh, maybe a teaspoon, and then start to wean down. But that's at least going to give you nutrient density than the processed refined sugars that we would see in like a flavored yogurt. And then you could cut up some berries for more antioxidants. You could add in some hemp seeds or something like that. But probiotic foods are really important, again, to support your microbiome, which has that two-part impact of both the innate and the learned immune function. So if you're not doing dairy, you could do a coconut-based yogurt. You could also consider drinking kombucha. You could do sauerkraut, pickled vegetables, but a probiotic food at least five days a week would be a really important goal to focus on. Okay, seems pretty doable. Yeah. You were gonna do that example week of eating or yeah. dairy? Oh, okay. Your recent um, Naturally Nourished podcast, 202, I know it was geared towards um, teens and tweens. Yeah. But as I listen to it, it is really a great 
learners jump into kind of more paleo keto getting this anti-inflammatory diet under your belt kind of thing so if if people are very new to this that might be a really great place to start Absolutely. yeah it's really good Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. I'll link that in um, notes for you guys. So yeah, it's episode 202 of the Naturally Nourished podcast. And it was, it was called Teens and Tweens, like Optimal Eating 101 or something like that. But yeah. it, we talk about label lingo, I think in that one as well of like carb to protein balance on if you're buying a bar, for instance, yeah. you know, um, we compare the ideas of like a cliff bar, which yeah. is like 46 grams of carbs to 11 grams of protein and very little fat. Yeah. Um, to something like maybe a RX bar, which uses yeah. like the egg whites and dates and nuts um, and has a better profile. Maybe it's like 22 grams of carbs to 15 grams of protein. And so one of my rules of thumb that I go over in that episode is carb to protein ratio should at least be 50%. Protein should at least be 50% of the carb or they should be equivalent. And unfortunately, in the standard American diet, we're all overfed, but we're malnourished. Mm -hmm. And we are eating really high refined carb intake. And so if you look at that 75 grams a day, most Americans are consuming over 300 grams. So this is going to be quite a slash. And if you get your mojo and you start feeling really great, I recommend weaning that down further and even playing with the ketogenic diet where the world of nutritional ketosis is even further than supporting reducing your, your hemoglobin A1C and getting your blood sugar under control. The cool thing is when you start to produce ketones, ketones have their unique own mechanisms of action that can enhance immune function, that can reduce oxidative stress. They're a cleaner burning fuel than just being a sugar burner. So if you're just using glucose and you don't have access to ketones in your body, you're putting out more oxidative stress, which sets you up for higher complications. And we also see really unique mechanisms of ketones on our T helper cells, which play a big mechanism in that acquired a learn, learned immune system. System, and we see that insulin resistance hinders that pathway. So definitely, I think that that would be a, a great jumpstart. And if you're looking for like a program of support there, we have a September launch of my 12-week food as medicine ketosis program. Yeah, that launches September 9th. Um, and so that could be a good fit if you guys are like, I just need more support on where to start and what to do. Um, but okay, let's go through an example day. So this could be like waking up and having, um, maybe because it's a busy chaotic morning, um, you want to whip up a um, protein shake um, or have a leftover slice of a frittata. So if you're doing a protein shake, I would recommend doing like an unsweetened almond milk or um, full fat coconut milk and then diluting that with a little bit of water as the base. Um, you could throw in like cacao, which is um, raw chocolate powder that has no sweetener in it, that has really high antioxidant capacity. Um, also can be a great mood boost and a little bit of an energizer. So you could throw in like a teaspoon of cacao, a tablespoon of almond butter to add a little bit more healthy fat to hold you over. You could throw in two to three cups of baby spinach or some leafy greens in that, blend that up, and then you could put in a scoop of grass-fed whey. And that would be like a keto version. Now, if you're just doing low carb, you could maybe even add in half of a frozen banana and that would work really beautifully for you. Um, so that would be a protein shake option with all whole foods. If you're doing a grass-fed whey, that's another way to support your immune system because if it's non-denatured or a low heat quality extracted grass-fed whey, um, that's going to have CLAs, conjugated linoleic acids, healthy fats from the cows eating grass. This further supports your insulin response in the body. And then we also get immunoglobulins if it's non-denatured. And this is really important for our toddlers and our young children um, because they're just starting to build up their immunoglobulin function. And so getting that non-denatured way into kiddos could be a great tool as well. Um, you could alternatively do like a slice of a frittata. Um, I have a YouTube video with a cheddar caramelized onion kale frittata. So you can have that made on Sunday and then you just heat up a slice and eat it and head out the door. Um, and then your lunch could be as simple as like canned skipjack tuna with some chopped olives and some avocado on a bed of spring mix um, with like a really simple vinaigrette with um, maybe like a white balsamic and olive oil blend. Um, you could do, if you wanted, an apple and some almonds as a snack midday or a cheese stick. I always pair carbs with a protein or a fat. 
And then that evening meal could be like a sirloin steak with some roasted asparagus and a half cup of roasted sweet potato. Um, and that's actually a lot of food. You know, some people would be able to kind of skimp on some of that, but that's well within that 75 grams. That day is probably an example of like a 45 gram of carb day. We had a question about snacking on keto. So I think you, you kind of talked about that. Um, Steven is, says that he's a commuter and he has an hour and a half, I think, um, uh, yeah, hour and a half both directions, bad at snacking, any tips. But I think, yeah, once you are fully keto adapted, I think that that snackiness kind of goes away. So it, it might get better as you go. Um, but I think you gave some really great tips as far as the snacking um, in the car. Yeah, your same kind of things that are great for snacking in the classroom. So like your cheese sticks, your chomps, or Eat your sticks, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, any of those. Um, I love boiled, hard boiled eggs. I don't know if you're an egg person like that. Yeah. I love that. It's just easy and, and also get, great for kids. And then another um, mama was asking, let's see here, uh, Tatiana um, is asking if breastfeeding moms can join your program. Yeah, most definitely. And um, we have a particular protocol for breastfeeding mamas. Awesome. So awesome. we are on that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. So as far as let's take a look here. Oh, so, oh, moms, talk to us about, so you know, those are our dietary ideas for what we can do as um, grownups. What about our kids? You know, not only our classroom kids, but our own personal children. Yeah. We kind of gear that towards them. So, you know, again, sugar and reduction of sugar is super important because of the impact on the immune system, but also the fact that sugar is inflammatory. There was actually a study that came out showing that high fructose corn syrup specifically, not just sugar in general, but high fructose corn syrup inhibits your vitamin D conversion process. So it inhibits the activated form of vitamin D, which can interfere with such a protective mechanism for your immune system. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, pulling out all refined carbs and processed sugary foods. Um, for your children, they do have more metabolic flexibility than adults. So you may not need to focus on necessarily a number of grams of carb restriction, but I would say every time they have a carbohydrate, focus on it coming from a whole food form, like a fruit or a starchy vegetable. Um, I do take more of a paleo approach with even the children in my practice where we try to practice more grain free. Um, so we'll do like almond flour based crackers, like Simple Mills are, is a great brand and they make an almond flour, pretty clean cheddar cracker or plain cracker that I um, have Stella um, use as an option at school. Um, also anytime they have a carb, we want them to have that protein or fat. So starting to teach your kids young and giving them empowered decisions that are guided. So, you know, asking them specifically for your protein at dinner tonight, would you like wild salmon or would you like grass fed burger patty? Um, because if you just ask your kids what they want to eat for dinner, it's going to be pizza and, you know, French fries or something like that. So we have to give them categorical autonomy. And so what I mean by that is, again, you're giving them ownership or decision-making process, but you're empowering them by making it a win-win selection. So you're not going to say, what do you want for dinner? And then they say, you know, pizza. And then you say, well, we're not having that because that just disempowers them. And then they feel like, well, what the heck? Mom never listens to me anyway. Um, so the same goes in the world of trying to keep a vegetable at at least two meals of their day. So, you know, sending a vegetable with their lunch, having a vegetable present in the dinner meal and asking them to be engaged within that process um, selecting or maybe even playing a role with preparation, really important. Um, and protein is so important for children. So many kiddos do not have ample protein intake and have too high of blood sugar. And if they're on that blood sugar roller coaster of highs and lows, that's what drives so much of the behavioral issues and the concentration and focus and irritability and, and mood jags and such. Protein is so key for growth and development and the immune system. Our immunoglobulins that aid in that tagging process require proteins to build. Um, when we're looking at protein choice, we want our kids to have more red meat. I would say at least four meals a week should be red meat minimum because that's where they're going to get that zinc and they'll get the selenium in seafood. So try to get your kids to also have wild fish at least twice a week as another protein focused food goal. And then um, the grass fed whey, another great protein, especially if your kids are still working on their savory palate. 
for your kiddos, you could do just really simple, like full fat coconut milk, a cup of frozen strawberries, um, and maybe even a date or a little um, raw honey if we're needing to work their palate down from hyper sweet palate. Um, and then adding that grass fed whey, and then you know you don't have to make theirs with the greens and all that right away, work them into the habit of enjoying a smoothie. And that's something they can bring to school as a lunch too, like in those swell water bottles, a really great way to pack in nutrient density. If your kid is struggling with deli meats and getting protein in at their lunch hour, uh, a smoothie could work as a great way. You can get 24 grams of protein in a scoop of grass fed whey, and then just work on more like fat focused snacks. Awesome, awesome. Ali, kind of getting to the nitty gritty, what are some of your um, concerns as a functional practitioner uh, with the um, uh, mandates or, or I guess I should say with the risks associated um, with the mandates or the guidelines, the back to school guidelines that were put under? So I'm working on some resources for you guys. We just released today one on disinfectants or which one was it? Screen time today is the one that I released. Mm -hmm. So I'll be releasing these really cool shareable infographs for you guys. And they kind of have like a, a, a good, better, best scenario in them of ways that you can mitigate these four areas of concern. So the first concern is um, using disinfectant products that are toxic. Um, and so, of course, you know, we want to ensure that we have antiviral support and that we're cleaning um, our schools, of course, and disinfecting. Um, but there are disinfectants like your, quant your quats or quaternary ammonium. This is in like your Clorox bleach leech wipes as a common household product, um, but it's in a lot of the germ foggers and the sprayers that are being used that are having higher parts per million or particle count than would be necessarily safe um, for the body weight of a child. And the concern is the quats in particular, that classification of disinfectants um, are the highest hazard and they can harm reproductive health. They have um, endocrine disrupting function. And so for my teachers, I have had to, in other environments, when I've worked with teachers that have had multiple miscarriages and are on an infertility treatment protocol with me, where I've had to write to their place of work beyond the school in an office or whatnot, maybe that secretary is really all about spraying Lysol into the air during, you know, other flu seasons and such. And I've had to write, um, you know, notes to their HR department about the hazards and risk association and how that's not safe for my client. Um, so that's a big concern, neurological, reproductive, and endocrine um, harm from disinfectants. So we'll talk in a moment about if you don't have control about advocating for what types of formulas are used, what you can do in your environment to help with the filtration and all of that. Okay. Um, the second concern is um, the mask um, risk factors for the wearer. Um, so looking at the influence of um, inhaling oral bacteria into the respiratory tract, um, closing the circuit of the expelling factor of our respiratory system so the child isn't able to expel toxins, again, from the inhaled maybe disinfectants or expel also CO2 as well. So we can start to see um, a, a start of a closed circuit on their respiratory function, which can be concerning. And we're already starting to see more um, in the medical field, more cases of bacteria pneumonia from mask wearing um, or mask knee as a lot of people are seeing from staph infection and such. Um, so that's a concern. The third concern I would say is the um, development of the child's empathy and emotional intelligence. Um, so the importance of collaboration and sharing and engaging um, and that can create a, somewhat of a sterile, stressful environment. And then the final one is low herd exposure. If we keep putting barriers and we're protecting from exposure, um, then it's going to only prolong the, the whole timeline of, of passing the viral pandemic. Absolutely. I feel uh, we have kind of a two tiered system. Either we're gonna be completely virtual or we'll be in-person teaching. And I have concerns on both sides of that. Um, we, if the kiddos are in the classroom, we've got some serious mandates. That I feel like I really want to try to pick your brain and, and learn from you from this, this um, what you're doing here, this webinar, as far as how can I help with like the mask mandates? How can I help um, the kiddos? I don't know, I guess, how can Throw I them do safer? Or, yeah, sorry? how can I do less harm? I like I have to have the, you know, I, I have to have them wear them for yes. certain amounts of time. How can I mitigate the harm that might be caused 
Um, I think that's one of my number one in-person teaching. Yeah. So let's start with masks. I think that's a great area. So, so one thing that I'm a huge advocate of during the time of, of mandated facial coverings is uh, the preference of face shields over cloth masks. Um, and it's for a couple reasons. One is that face shields um, allow more of an open flow airway, right? So you're not getting as much of that, that blockage of that suppression of bacteria or that clo clo more of a closed circuit based on the expulsion. Okay. Um, you're also able to have expression. Um, and so, you know, especially when we're talking about the delicate ages where spe speech pathology and pronunciation and reading comprehension are all really integral to development and learning process, but also in the world of, again, empathy, humanity, and emotional intelligence, learning the appropriate, especially when we're talking about like autistic spectrum and such, when we're learning what's appropriate gestures, what's appropriate facial <laughs> expression, is that appropriate? You know, what's the feedback when I make this face versus this face? And how do I read what's be behind? Really hard to the teacher face to the kids. They're not yeah. going to be able to get the teacher face. Yeah. Right. The stern, the one that you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I would say if you can advocate for facial shield, that's going to really take at least 50%. I mean, not statistically, but, but a significant reduction of a lot of the concerns um, that we have. Now, if your school does mandate cloth masks in particular, um, then for the parent, I would ensure that the cloth is not microban or a, a, there's a lot of materials that are actually using like bleach and other chemicals in the material now. So I'm not a fan of that because then you're just inhaling again, another toxin into your system mm -hmm. in a closed circuit. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely recommend using a cloth that is like a certified organic cloth. Um, we're also even starting to see the microfibers of the PPE standard, you know, like surgical masks that those um, fibers can actually be inhaled and are starting to create some stress in the respiratory tract. So just cotton, organic cotton would be a great okay. option as far as if you must wear a cloth mask. Um, and then other things as far as within that wearing, um, safe removal would be really important and storage strategy. So okay. during lunchtime, are we talking about how it's removed? Are we putting it surface down? We're not flipping it so the part that was at our face goes mm -hmm. down on the desk and that's being touched. So safe removal and storage. Um, I'm not sure how schools are right now navigating that. Do you guys have that in a protocol of like where they're placing them for lunch? Right now we are at two weeks virtual, so they're still laying out all the protocols. As, as far as I'm hearing is the kiddos are gonna be here in the classroom eating. We're gonna go to the cafeteria or it's gonna be brought to the room and they're okay. still staying at their own desk. So the surface is their own surface that they've been at all day. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's not a protocol on removal of like masks. Where is it sitting on their desk? Yeah, I and hear that we might have um, like lanyards, but I also hear that that's not a good thing necessarily. So Okay. So I, I think that that's something that needs to be definitely troubleshooted and, and discussed because if we're creating, you know, something that has, we know from the inside, it has our bacteria, right? And our droplets. And so that's what we're trying to protect from other people. And then on the outside, we have surface bacteria. And so we don't want to, we definitely want to make sure that the mask has a very clear inside outside. And so it's not interchangeable and we're wearing it backwards after lunch. Um, and um, of course, um, practicing hand washing after taking off and then practicing hand washing um, prior to putting back on after lunch would be important on both ends of the spectrum. Um, allowing ideally in an ideal scenario, and this is kind of repeated throughout an, an hour of outside time per day, ideally an hour of maskless time per day as well. Um, and so mask breaks are something to consider with your school board and discuss what that would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the way that you breathe when wearing the mask is really important. I think a lot of even adults and starting to teach your children this, if it's mandated for their schools, um, a lot of us tend to breathe more rapid and shallow when we're wearing a mask. It just creates a little bit of anxiety. Um, and so we tend to also open our mouths and kind of breathe like this. Um, and so that's putting more of that hot, moist respiratory bacteria into the mask. Um, and that also bypasses when the child or adult inhales, they're not getting that regulation of moisture. The nares or the no nasal hairs actually work as a filter. So you're missing that filter when you're just breathing through your mouth. <gasps> 
you're taking this huge orifice with no filter all the way into your respiratory tract. So teaching sealed mouths when breathing in a mask is really important. So predominantly focusing on nasal breath. Um, and I think that there needs to be discussion with children if, if um, face shields are not allowed, there has to be a face shield policy for children that have rhinitis or runny noses. Because we all know, I think with your fifth grade class, not as much as a first through third grade or kindergarten through second yeah. grade, yeah. but I mean, kids are gunky. <laughs> and so having a cloth mask that's holding that gunk is just, that's non-functional. And so we have right. to figure out when then is that necessary and, and how that whole step goes because those kids can't no nasally breathe because they're so congested. Yeah. Um, and, and starting with your kids for any season, any cold flu stuff, um, starting to teach your kids young, like age two onward, to blow out snot um, so that they're not, you know, the classic that stuff that <laughs> kids do that when they suck it all up there. Um, and that like drives me crazy. My daughter does that. I'm just like, blow it out. Your body's trying to help you. It's trying to help you get rid of stuff. Yes. Yes. So, so, so coming up with policies for nose blowing, honestly, will be a thing as well. Like, do they stand up and walk over to the trash can where there is a station where there are Kleenexes, where they're able to safely remove and set their mask down. I mean, that all needs, because otherwise you're gonna be in that scenario in a that's moment. That's a great consideration. I, that's something I haven't even thought of. So I, I definitely now I'm reconsidering some of the setup that I have over by the trash area, but for sure. What are some of your, I've got kind of two questions. What are your suggestions as far as mask rem removal during times of like getting a drink of water out of their water bottle or, um, because the kids are supposed to, even during instruction, they're saying, anytime I'm communicating with them, I have to wear a mask and they have to wear a mask, mm -hmm. even if we're social distance within the classroom. Mm -hmm. So if they take off to take a drink of water, because that is going to be one of my ways of having built-in mask breaks. Mask breaks, water mm -hmm. break. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's your suggestion for, um, just off the top of your head, what would yeah. be a good way to I mean, I don't think it's appropriate to set it down on the desk, even though that's right. your surface. Yeah. Um, again, just because there's disinfectants used on that desk and, you know, I, I just, I, I don't think that that makes best sense. I think that in, in theory, there would be like a hook off of the desk or something like that, right? Okay. That you like okay. hang it so okay. that it's at least getting airflow versus setting flat flush on a surface. Um, Okay. So I, I don't know if there's something on their chair or their desk where there could be like a hook like scenario. I think that that would be the best um, okay. or that the parent offers at least in their lunch, a container or a surface hole, you know, where like, it's like a soap dish essentially, you know? Okay. Um, and that, that, that would be a problem as far as like, I don't know, like a containment as far as I wouldn't put a lid on it. Yeah. I mean, okay. just like a, so something they could put in. Okay. Like a so bowl, like a soap the dish. Surface of the desk. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of those like silicone reusable food bags, you know, to have like that maybe as like a mask pad, like a desk pad. That works. Okay. And then we had another question about in the comment box about um, what kind of disinfectants do you actually recommend? Good. Yeah. So right before I go to that, I just want to say the last thing on the masking world um, is um, pulse socks. I'm really um, passionate about this and, you know, there's a lot of controversial videos. You can watch some that show people saying, you know, masks don't fulfill OSHA requirements for oxygenation and CO2 levels get high. You'll see other people saying nothing's happening. It's totally safe. The reality is we have no randomized clinical trial on safety and efficacy of use in children for an entire classroom day. So we're all in the experiment right now. And I'm really advocating strong to create an experiment so that we can feel more confident and come up with measures that work. But in the interim, what we can bare minimum do is get a 15 to $30, these are super cheapo, pulse oximeter, and mine's in the other room, I was gonna have it, um, but it just goes on your pointer finger, your index finger, and if we're at 95 to 100, this is optimal oxygenation of the blood. Um, but if a child in your classroom is acting irrational or is complaining of a fever or headache, or is you're noticing something off with their behavior, it would be a very easy check. And at minimum, the school nurse should have this because mm -hmm. oxygen is vital to life and oxygen optimization is vital to a learning environment. 
And so ensuring that they are getting that is really important. And um, especially, like I said, at the nurse, if there are migraines or headaches or health complications, and this is something in the household that you can do as well, beyond the constructs of masking, um, I've now had 70 plus clients that have been infected with COVID, um, all successful on the other end, some currently in their intervention mode. Um, but the pulse ox is really helpful for them to monitor themselves at home, um, you know, where they'll see their values maybe going down to 93, but if you know it drops below 90, then you probably need some oxygen therapy support. And so having that as a monitoring system can be very helpful. And some people are seeing pulse ox go down, but no fever. So it's another quantitative measure of potential infection as well. So I just think it's a really important for safety and also just for monitoring outcomes. Um, okay. So... Yeah, cleaning materials. So I am a big proponent of um, hydrogen peroxide because it's cheap, it's easy, it's effective. It is EPA and CDC approved for um, COVID um, SARS-2. So it fits the bill. Bono, which is like the, the floor company has a, a line, it's called Power Plus. I'll link that in my um, summary notes. And then I ordered for Stella, my daughter's school from Green Building Supply. It was a, a cheaper, large, multiple gallon hydrogen peroxide solution, um, a pretty generic brand. And it had just um, orange essential oil in it. Um, and so that's a great option. And as well known, there's also um, hypochlorous acid and sodium hydroxide as a combination. This is basically like salt tabs with vinegar and water. And Force of Nature is one of the companies that does this where they have this electrical vat that when you add that in, it charges it. The issue with that, that's a great option for the household and daycare. The issue I think for school implementation is that needing that base of charge and the actual functionality of it, I think it might be an additional barrier, but it is very effective and a great option. But that's why I'm advocating more clearly for hydrogen peroxide. I think it's just an easier known. Um, bleach would be our middle ground, a diluted bleach solution. Um, it still has been shown to be supportive, uh, excuse me, harmful for respiratory um, systems. So that's why I'm not a big fan of it on the daily. Um, it can reduce antioxidant status in children, but it doesn't have the harmful endocrine or hormone influence or neurological influence that those quat um, materials do. Okay. And then um, the only other, the ways that I, so the other thing with then the cleaning solution is if you can't advocate, let's say I had a letter that I put out um, in my blog of advocating for these types of cleaner solutions. If your school board is not on, on board with that and they're still gonna use a quat, bare minimum, increasing the filtration in your classroom would be really important. Um, so you can get a HEPA filter um, starting at like $120. Um, I like the, for that one, the Honeywell 100 True is 129. Um, the fancier versions like the Air Doctor is another really good one that you might consider um, You know, if, you, if you're the one investing it and you're taking it with you to your classroom for the next five years, then that might be totally worthwhile. Sure. Um, but the HEPA filter at 129, I think is something reasonable that parents can collaborate on and purchase for their classroom or again, the teacher. And um, I don't see any school saying you can't bring in a filter, you know, in this sense, but checking on whether the school as a parent or as the teacher is following guidelines for a filtration plan and airflow, because I know the concern is a lot of windows don't open and a lot of doors need to be closed because of the concern for school violence, um, that that throws a little bit of a, again, a closed circuit system. And that puts us at a little bit more harmful risk which would be my final recommendation to mitigate, which is getting them outside for at least an hour a day. Um, just so important for them to get outside away from screens, regardless of if they're doing a homeschool model, a hybrid or at school, um, bare minimum, just to get the natural sunlight in their pineal gland of their brain to help with melatonin, um, to provide them some natural vitamin D, to provide them grounding and access to the earth for electrical charge that helps to reduce anxiety and supports a robust immune system. So much benefit and I think really important, even if we have to pull them in pods to get the kids outside for at least an hour a day. And if that's not in your school's policy, then as a parent, you can ensure you advocate that the second they get in the door. Or even as a teacher, the homework can be go outside. You yeah, know? I like Send that. Them outside, give them something to do. They got to find something. Go outside. Yes, <laughs> love it. Awesome. So speaking of the teachers, what can we do to help our whole body health? You know, we want to bring as optimized 
um, system as possible into the classroom to be with the kids, to be the best we can be? How, how can we do that? Yeah. So I think it's really important to be mindful of your mental space first and foremost, because, you know, we don't have control always of our environment. There's these little ways that we can try to mitigate and support, but we do have control of our reactivity to the environment. And we do have control of the thoughts that we allow in our space, in our sacred space. Um, and so often we keep our own inner mean girl or mean boy, whoever's listening, um, <laughs> in our subconscious, in that basement of the brain. And that can really start to wreak havoc on whole body health. When we are in a fight or flight stress response, that puts out cortisol, which is the primary stress responding hormone, which drives blood sugar release from the body. So you get a blood sugar spike. Cortisol also drives belly fat. It can drive agitation and anxiety. It can break down muscle mass. So it can do some harm metabolically, hormonally, and mood wise, as well as interfering with quality and depth of sleep. Um, so we really wanna try to harness the stallion of the brain. And one way to do that is with gratitude practice, um, you know, framing each day with three things that you're grateful for when you start and close your day. I think that that's a really powerful way to see things without this doomsday impact of media of really kind of what you're owning and claiming. Um, practicing mantra um, can be really empowering as well. So it could be an I am statement or it can be tied to breath. It can be I inhale um, serenity, I exhale anxiety. Um, and then when you practice that in your silent space or even on your drive to work, then when you're just breathing passively, those words kind of find you and can bring you to peace of mind. Or even just breaking down negative thought patterns of like something in the scenario of, this is so stupid, I can't believe that I have to do this. Or, or you know, even something that you just don't agree with that you have to implement on your day-to-day -day function, regardless of what it is and what said policy, you have to make peace with the now. You don't have to accept it 100%, but you have to make peace with it because otherwise you're just going to be energetically or emotionally battling something and you're going to feel anger and you're going to harness that anger and that only is going to harm you. It's not going to help any of the outcomes of the situation. So it might be something like changing a conversation in your head from this is so stupid, it's not gonna work, to this is the policy as it is now. This is the policy as it is now. And that's just neutral, at least. At least that's not shaming and judging and it frees you from that, that negative space. Um, and then you can work in something positive in a different part of your world that maybe you have more power of manifesting. Um, so I think that's super important. Absolutely. Um, I love the gratitude thing too. I really want to try to implement that even with the kids. We, we do a, like a morning meeting and yeah. that's such a great practice. Okay, let's start off. Who, who's got something they're grateful for? I love great, that so much. Bring that into the kids. Love and that. you know what? I think in the side of also, um, Lindy, I love that because you can also mitigate the disconnect of the expression of nonverbal communication with the mask mandate by overemphasizing humanity and empathy and mm -hmm. other elements in your classroom. And I think that's super important as well. So that's where that gratitude would be like a two for one. You're helping them with their mental, emotional health. But you're also helping them to connect and you're helping them to see the beauty of humans. Um, and I think that that's really important to be proactively seeding through this time of what could be perceived by many kids as fear and anxiety and segregation sure. um, or isolation. Um, so I think that that communal warmth is really important where we can manifest that. Absolutely. Um, so other things teachers can do, um, same recommendation of homework for teachers, get outside at least an hour a day. Um, awesome if you can ground, so barefoot walking in the, in the grass, getting your feet in the mud, if you live by the ocean, even cooler with sand um, and water. All of these things are a great way to offset the energy of the electronics that we spend our day around and really to help us to calm down and get into that parasympathetic regulatory space. Um, and breath work, I'm a huge fan of. So beyond with your mask, breathing with sealed lips um, and just using nasal breath, um, I like to use techniques of breath to really bring us into this safe place. Like I said, we all are in survival mode. And so when we have the ability, we wanna harness that parasympathetic safe place. That's where everything's optimized. Um, so I use a technique called four, seven, eight breath. This would be only used without a mask to be clear. Um, 
And so this could be at home or, you know, before or after your work shift or something like this. Um, and the best way to do it is um, sitting with your feet flat on the ground and inhaling for four through your nose, holding for seven, and then exhaling with like a whooshing for eight. Um, I talk about this in both of my um, books and maybe we should all do it together. Are you okay on time? Oh, I'm totally Can fine. Can you go into like 5.15? Yeah, let's okay, do cool. it. Okay, cool. I got a so whoosh. Let's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to do the breath with you guys. So you can all experience it. Um, so try to sit somewhere kind of comfortable and we're all going to inhale, seal your lips. Well, I can't cause I'm talking. Um, and then we're going to breathe in for four and you're going to hold for seven. And now you're going to whoosh with your mouth. Shh. And it's like, you should feel a little lightheaded, right? Like, whoa, a little woozy. Yeah. And it actually sends, when you whoosh like that, or shoosh out, um, you're basically expelling or exhaling at a two to one ratio of your inhale, right? And that long hold in the middle, mm -hmm. it starts to send signals down your vagus nerve, which is the largest nerve of the body. It starts in the brainstem and ends in the colon. And it literally, three cycles of that can put you into a parasympathetic space. So it can be used to manage panic attack, but it can also be used to just get you into that yummy rest, digest, regulatory, reproduce, metabolize space. So even practicing that at the dinner table before you eat, you're going to enhance your body's ability to make digestive enzymes. You're going to enhance a shift of your heart rate. Um, and so that 478 is a great proactive breath work to do outside of the mask time because we don't want to shush with spit in our mask. I just want to be clear on that. You want to keep yeah, your there. Are there any modifications that we could do with the kids in the classroom if they have to be masked just as like a calm down technique? So you could, I would definitely encourage, right, the lip sealed and I would just do an in for four, hold for five, out for two. In for four, hold for five, out for two. So it would just be like, hold your nose. and then just held and then out maybe three out, I guess. Yeah. So like, a, it's going to be almost more comparable. Um, but oh, I'm sorry, the out has to go longer. Excuse me. So you'd be <laughs> in for four, hold for four or five, and then you'd try to push out through your nose for like seven, um, okay. you know, as much as you could, but, but they'll probably out. get a little more. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And you could just teach them in the sense of like, Hey, have you ever seen like a, a spa, how the words say exhale, you know, like we don't want to hold our breath. Like we're scared. We want to release our breath. And so that's that relaxation. When we're scared, we go <gasps> and we just inhale repetitively and we're not releasing. So I think just having that conversation about that equal release, at least finding that, and you could, you could show ocean and show like the in and out type of thing. And that could be really helpful as well. Awesome. Love that. All right. Um, another question here. Let's see yeah. here. As a teacher, um, how can I protect my family when I come home from school? My son is immunocompromised, but we have been told we we go to work or we resign. So okay. <laughs> well. Um, yeah. So um, one thing that I'd recommend doing is a saline um, rinse on your way um, home. So I really like, a, you can use like a neti pot, which is, you know, going to be the pot where you add your own salt solution and you do it over the sink. That's a little intensive um, for transition to home. Um, there's a nasal spray called Exlear. Um, it uses uh, xylitol and saline and a little bit of grapefruit spray, um, grapefruit extract, excuse me. Um, and so this is done as a nasal spray. And so you can do a spray um, in your car. You can keep it in your purse or your briefcase. And you can do a spray in your car. And what that does is that clears your nares or your, your, your viral load if you contracted any out of your respiratory tract. Um, that's something I would do pre and post for everyone really on pre and post school because it just does that reset or anytime you're at a space of exposure of multiple people, right? Um, so that's something you can do proactively. And then um, I would say you would also wanna consider like running an essential um, oil diffuser in your household. Um, so these are all things that anyone can do actually really for immune health in their household. Um, so running an essential oil um, diffuser would be fantastic with like antiviral compounds like oil of oregano, eucalyptus, 
lavender, um, tea tree, all of these can be used in, in pairs. You don't want to make a super hodgepodge <laughs> flavor profile of smell, but in pairs, like combinations work really well. Um, and that's a really great way also. So within your household to have that proactive defense against viral load. Um, but the reality is we're really not seeing that carrier transmission. Um, it, it, it's really, you know, going to be if you were positive infected. And I think that all these proactive measures are going to play a huge role of reducing your risk factor anyway. Um, I don't worry about, I think that the surface stuff is, is, has been proven to not be as significant as we had once thought. So I wouldn't necessarily say you have to take your shoes off at your house or anything like outside of your house or anything like that. Um, I think a diffuser and doing the nasal spray is a good reset. And then, you know, keeping proactive with your immune support, with some supplement support and the diet strategy so that you don't carry a high viral load. Because it's both the presence of the droplets and what you take in, and then what your immune system allows to stay as what impacts your level of infection. And then, you know, your comorbidities and all those lifestyle factors of how deep you get infected. Um, but, you know, but if you are- yourself will help you take care of those- right compromised in your in your household exactly so if you are and that's the controversy of asymptomatic carriers and why we're seeing that they likely are not going to be a huge role of creating high amounts of infection because they're not they're not sneezing they don't have higher droplet output because they're not coughing sneezing expressing um, and so it's all about that volume of that viral load yeah absolutely uh, um sleep and yeah therapy, things like that I can you kind of speak to us on those kind of things? Yeah, so sleep is super important. I mean, that's honestly when your immune system does its best work, when you're sleeping. Um, and that's actually also when your metabolism is optimized when you're sleeping. Um, and so if we're talking about, again, you know, both the, co the comorbidity world as well as immune system health, at least seven hours of sleep a night is really important. Um, just like for our babies, adults also need sleep hygiene and routine. And so I really recommend cutting off the blue light or the screen time at least an hour before bed. Um, and that would mean even reading, like trying not to use a tablet, but instead using a book <laughs> um, or paging through a magazine or taking an Epsom salt bath um, or spending time talking with your partner with a candle lit in the bedroom, um, you know having sex, all of those types of things are actually really supportive of immune system and also giving you that oxytocin of that connection. Um, and that's also a, such a powerful antidepressant and immune supporter. Um, and so, you know, taking time to slow down before it's actual bedtime is really important and getting yourself into that rested mode. Um, maybe doing some uh, stretches or like foam rolling is all really important. The temperature in your household, turning it down a couple notches if possible, and then dark out. Um, so you, whether you have blackout curtains or you wear, I wear an eye mask, um, and I'm pretty conditioned to sleeping with it now. Um, it's like all, all I can, I, I love that security of like lights out. <laughs> it's a done deal. Um, and then you might consider things like um, melatonin. Uh, melatonin has fantastic literature specific to COVID, um, and it actually has some anti-inflammatory effects very um, powerful antioxidant um, that has been shown to be supportive against breast cancer as well. Um, so melatonin is something that could be a beautiful add-in. Somewhere between three to five grams would be a really good dosage. And kids um, have even been shown in literature upwards of 20 um, gram milligrams, not grams, excuse me, 20 milligrams a day of being a safe dosage. Um, now that's a pretty high dosage, but just saying that there's really not known toxicity and, and dependence as we had once thought decades ago. Um, so you could play with something. I have a formula called sleep support, which also has skull cap in it. And skull cap is another herb that works that ACE2 mechanism of how the virus attaches to our cells. So that could be a really cool, powerful player where you're getting that skull cap and the melatonin that's helping with deep restful sleep, but you're also getting some of that traditional Chinese herb to support against the respiratory virus. Fantastic, love it. Um, and then movement, movement. Like if you don't, if you don't use your body during the day, it's not going to want to rest and lay down. <laughs> so making sure you're getting, even if you're sitting in the classroom all day, I love the idea of mask breaks and water breaks, maybe movement breaks um, mm -hmm. as best you can navigate. Yeah. And um, you know, um, 
I'm going to forget Zach Bush. He's the Dr. MD. Um, he does a nitric oxide workout, which would be really cool in the classroom. It's four movements. Okay. And um, one of it is like squats. So you're doing squats and you're bumping your arms back. The next movement is arms like this, where you make like a 90 degree pumping angle. Um, the third movement is claps above and below your, your waistline. And you do them really fast. <sighs> and so you're like doing this really rapid. And then um, the last one is like, like a kind of like celebratory Taibo yeah. <laughs> arm circle. Um, but that's something that you, I'll link the video. You could do that in the classroom. And it's awesome because it's a nitrogen oxide push, which helps with oxygenation and blood flow. Um, and it's also a really great way that it's like a hit training. If you do it for three minutes, you could play a fun song in the classroom. That could be a really neat ritual for everyone to do oh, together. Love it. love it. Very, very cool. Um, and hydration is the last thing I want to comment oh, on for, for everyone in the classroom, out of the classroom. Um, be mindful again that masks interfere with the way that your body regulates the hydration in your respiratory tract. Um, and so the body may need some recalibration. Being mindful of being proactive with electrolytes um, would be important, but drinking at least half of your body weight in fluid ounces of water. So I go through, like, this is a little over a liter. I drink three liters of water a day. That's beyond half my body weight in fluid ounces of water. Um, but the more, the better. That moves lymphatic flow, that can reduce headaches, that can aid with hunger um, so much. And especially during this time of stress and an environment change in the classroom, to maintain that hydration is really going to help the transition. Okay. You can definitely make that work. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions over in the chat area. Yeah. And first question was, can an air purifier help in the classroom? And I think you've addressed that. Yes, definitely that can um, help. Um, and let's see here. This person is working in a spec ed classroom where students won't all be wearing masks. So I guess that their concern is, you know, uh, having good filtration there. And uh, another question about nursing mamas. Can the melatonin and skull cap be used while nursing? I don't know skull cap off the top of my head. Okay. But what I do know is um, when you go to my website, alimillardy.com, all of our formulas have an icon if it's breastfeeding safe, pregnancy safe, or safe for kids. Um, so I'm not sure off the top of my head. You can navigate too. That is such Thank a you. wonderful design. I, and, and safe for children too, which I, I like to see on there. Like Right. And then there's details always in the how to use. So I would check that out. I'm not sure off the top of my head on skull cap. I, be I believe so though. Um, yeah. And they just said, thanks, no problem. Cool. No problem. And my computer just died over there. Oh, <laughs> food. Oh, how have we not talked about food yet? Food is medicine. Yes. <laughs> how can we uh, impact our health through our food? Yeah. So, um, a couple areas of focus. Again, we're thinking about just a recap for those of you that are joining us late. We're thinking about reducing inflammation. We're thinking about providing antioxidants to reduce oxidative stress. We're thinking about supporting our microbiome and our gut because that tissue, that GALT, gut associated lymphatic tissue, that's where the immune system resides. Um, and we're looking at keeping blood sugar under control so that we're not disengaging our immune system and that our T helper cell function can be optimized. So when you hit all of that, some particular foods that I'd go for, I'm a huge proponent of bone broth. Um, and um, bone broth would be something that could easily be brought into the classroom, especially as we're kind of in fall-ish. I mean, it's still triple digits in Austin here, <laughs> but I know you guys are all over. Um, yeah. So if it is fall, bless you, and I want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always cold in the classroom. I don't know about other yeah. people, but I, I bring my bone broth all the time. And it's so easy. You just have it right there in your, in your mug. It's yeah, great. so just having it in a thermos is awesome, and sending that with your kiddos to school would be really fantastic. Um, bone broth provides us L-glutamine, which is an amino acid that actually feeds your gut cells and helps to repair gut tissue. Really important right now because I'm seeing clinically a lot of more people dealing with gastric ulcers and leaky gut more than ever because stress literally drills holes in your gut. It literally tears up your guts. And we know it. We've experienced butterflies and you experience that rawness and that yuck feeling that you're kind of like curling up and wanting to hold in your body. So bone broth, collagen, and gelatin are the three magic players to help with repairing that gut integrity and also preventing inflammation in the body um, and creating a good house or foundation for the good gut bacteria to reside in. 
Um, so there are tons of recipes I have on the blog. I have new content coming out on the YouTube page about, you know, five ways to enjoy bone broth and, and so many other resources. You can blend things in it, um, like a can of crushed tomatoes and some full fat coconut milk and some basil and you got tomato basil soup. Um, you know, really simple blends and combinations that can make it palatable. So you're not just sipping hot meat juice. Um, and then Fond is a company out of, um, San Antonio. Yeah. yeah. They're the best. I mean, they, they make like tonic elixirs. They're like delectable bone broth blends where it doesn't just taste like hot meat juice. I, I love, and my, my daughter, she's like, mom, no, I cannot do bone broth. Babe, this is not the same thing that I make. This is, like you say, it's an elixir. It's yeah. so, it is so good. Yeah. They have like a poblano beet blend and like turmeric, conductor, black meat. pepper. Yeah. Huh? Conductor, whatever conductor is. I think it's got a, like a yellow squash or something in there. I don't know. Sage I, and butternut squash and oh, like, yeah. Chipo yeah uh -huh. So good. And so they don't puree it. They just, they actually make the broth with that as like an infusion of flavor and then they strain it out. So it's still great for a ketogenic diet and um, fantastic flavor profile. So bone broth um, and doing like six to eight ounces a day. If you don't want to bring it into the classroom, you could do that as a nightcap. Um, and bone broth also is going to provide us that collagen and gelatin in its structure. That's what it's pulling from the bones. And that's providing like a oopy goopy facelift for the gut, but also great connective tissue health, hair, skin, nails. We've seen in research that collagen can actually reduce cellulite. So there's all sorts of good stuff there. <laughs> Um, and then, um, you could sip on that in the evening because bone broth also gives you glycine, which can help with relaxation in the e end of the day. So that could be great. Tea is another one I'm super big proponent of. Um, so giving you all the, the liquids, um, doing a tea that has a lot of polyphenols. It could be caffeinated like a, a black tea. Black tea has been studied by Harvard university where individuals that had upwards of six to seven cups had increase in their interferon, which is their immune system's natural defense. Um, and so again, that would help your surveillance for that mom that was worried about the immune compromised uh, child at home. Again, layering in things like this means that if you are exposed, your immune system is going to say, pew, pew, get out of here, and you're not going to get infected. So that's, that's the variance is exposure versus infection. Um, so tea is fantastic. Um, even doing things like rooibos, um, all of the different botanicals in tea can really up that antioxidant capacity. And then there's actual immune properties within the tea leaf, which would be your green, white, or your black tea. Um, so that'd be a fantastic thing that you could bring in. Um, your alium family, your garlic, onion, shallots, leeks, um, a lot of these have antiviral capacity, um, garlic being the highest. So I like to actually smash a garlic clove and chop it up and then let it sit on my cutting board while I'm heating my bone broth. And then I um, pour my bone broth and I put that chopped raw stuff on top. And it's like the vampires are going to stay away from you. You might not want to kiss anyone after, but it is for sure a really great upper respiratory cleanser, if you will. Um, and garlic has some great antiviral support. Um, the whole alium family, which is your, your onion, garlic, shallots, leeks, um, these are going to help to support detoxification in the body as well. Um, they provide a lot of sulfur, which aids in your body's encapsulation and excretion or removal of debris from a pathogen that your body just battled or from maybe the toxins in your environment. Um, so great things to get there. We have a, a bone broth uh, recipe. It's a 40 clove of garlic soup recipe that Becky did on the blog, and it's phenomenal. Um, it's all cooked garlic, so it's not like super <laughs> volatile, um, but it's a great option. And then um, antioxidant capacity and anti-inflammatory with herbs, seasoning, spices. So um, using turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, adding cinnamon to your Greek yogurt that we talked about before, a great way to enhance the antioxidants. Slicing up fresh ginger, turmeric in your water to do a water infusion with. Um, doing these in salad dressings, um, berries are another fantastic antioxidant tool um, that could be in any of those deliveries. And then I always recommend two to three cups of leafy greens, a great way to get volume, but also to get magnesium, which can be a big mineral of focus when we're combating stress and the tension that we hold within our body. Um, so this could be done with kale chips. This could be done with a salad for your lunch option, um, or you could saute and um, simmer some greens as the base of a dish. 
Um, you could always sub out your grains for greens. So if you're doing to-go food and you're doing Chinese or Asian or whatever, try to pick the lowest carb savory option. And then instead of going on the bowl of pasta or you know um, rice, swap mm -hmm. that out for just a couple handfuls of leafy greens and you still get all the flavor and the good stuff. Good tip. Yeah. And then the last one I'd say is omega-3s. So trying to get wild fish, just like I said, for kids, for selenium, um, but also for the omega-3 fatty acids, I would say three times a week would be the good goal. Um, so you could do once a week as like a canned skipjack, which is a light tuna, um, mm -hmm. and then maybe making for dinner fish tacos one night um, in cabbage cups, and then another night doing like wild salmon with asparagus and sweet potatoes or something simple. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but we're almost there. <laughs> Awesome. Now we, we have a quick question. This is taking us back to the mask issues. You, would you like me to ask that now or? Sure. Yeah, okay. maybe. Yeah. So we've got um, Aaron asking, how would you suggest talking to admin about not enforcing masks if a child is taking it off, especially if they have communication issues? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's just a, a, personal relationship with your school board and probably also a parent organization um, and also directly with the teacher. You might, I mean, I don't know, maybe you probably have a better recommendation on that because I don't know always how, and I think the infrastructure is going to be varied, unfortunately, different based on location, based on your kiddo's school. Um, but I'm thinking that I would start direct with the teacher because at the end of the day, we all know that the teachers kind of have the, the end, end of the day control of what happens in their classroom environment. Well, it, and it depends on the mandates that are being put, placed on the teacher. So if, if this is a parent asking about that, it, maybe it would be good to have some of those linked, um, maybe the school is afraid of safety for the other kids that are in the class, but maybe if you could come to the table with some of the um, studies that you'll be linking here, that might be helpful as far as taking the, the worry of the fear away. Um, but also this might be something, if you're talking about a kiddo that has communication issues, this might be something to bring up with the speech pathologist. This might be something that, it, that you could incorporate in like an IEP or their 504. So there might be those avenues now that, we're getting into how, how do we individualize for that kid, that that might be an area where, well, he, he or she has communication issues, this is not appropriate for this particular child, have those discussions in those meetings with, you know, your panel. Um, but yeah, and I'm thinking, I'll honestly, that that's where it would be a better advocate for a face shield. And I have a feeling that what we'll see is more school, the schools that currently aren't allowing shields are going to, because yeah. that to me feels like the happy medium of where we're gonna get into this pinhole of, I can't educate this child without seeing their expression and I need to, you know, so I, I think that that's something that the parent could advocate for also, you know, on the forefront. And, and, and I'm kind of anticipating that that's how schools are gonna transition. Um, we don't know that again, every, everyone has their own policy. And, and I personally, the way I've advocated for my daughter is yes, we can be really emotional about these things. We can have belly feelings and intuition and passion. And the most important, um, element is to be empathetic and respectful and, um, proactive with kindness and understanding when you're communicating your positioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really massage the heck out of Stella's school. <laughs> like, like you guys are doing such a great job. I'm so on board with all these things. However, I have the following concerns. I'd love to have a conversation with someone about this. You know, it's just kind of this like seated thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was able to advocate for Stella's whole Montessori to be maskless for the children based on the research that I provided. And I will link that blog um, article. Mm -hmm. um, every school is different. Every size is different, everything. But same thing with like when we brought the disinfectants, we, we pur I purchased personally the hydrogen peroxide for her classroom. Um, and they were on board. They're like, well, we'll trial it in Stella's classroom. And then if the teachers like it, then we can bring it into the school. Um, and I provided them, you know, just research and information and concerns. And I want everyone, teachers and children, to be in a safe and non-toxic environment. And here's how we can do it. And here's how I can help you. I don't want this to be a headache for you guys. I want to create the resource and the avenue to make it happen. And so I think just really coming in it as a partnership versus a battle is really important energetically and emotionally so it's better received. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Last, last topic is supplements. <laughs> Ooh, I like this one. Okay. I like 
Top so this five, is a big request. Maybe? I don't know. There, I can't narrow things down that much, but can you give us top five recommendations? Uh, yes. for Thank you. So um, I think that the uh, maybe two most important ones would be the vitamin D balance blend. Um, and like I said, I really advocate for knowing where your vitamin D status is at. Um, 5,000 to 10,000 IUs would be an appropriate dosage depending on where you're at with your blood levels. If you don't know, it's likely safe to just take one capsule of my vitamin D balance blend, which is 5,000 IUs in there. There is a combination of K1 and K2 in there, and that's what makes it superior to many vitamin Ds that you'll just find at like Whole Foods or Walgreens. I emphasize that just for you all to know that long-term vitamin D use can create risk for calcification because vitamin D does play a role with how calcium is delivered to the bones. Um, and so if it does not have that K1, K2, then the vitamin D can create calcium deposits in our arterial area and also potentially causing stones like kidney stone. Um, and so if we are supplementing with vitamin D, it is important if it's not for my naturally nourished line that you always ensure that it's a combination of K1 and K2. Vitamin K plays a role with the regulation of the vitamin D and calcium in the body. And so it's a really important pairing to ensure with a vitamin D supplement. Um, the uh, second one that I would say is my Bio C Plus. Um, so the Bio C Plus is going to be really important because vitamin C, again, has been used as an intervention for treatment, but also as a preventative. And there's just so much literature on vitamin C as an antioxidant and as an immune supporter. Um, my Bio C Plus has five, 600 milligrams of vitamin C per capsule, which is a pretty hefty dosage. One to two capsules a day is really appropriate, um, but it goes further by having the source of vitamin C being from whole foods. So it uses acerola cherry, um, and it also has other bioflavonoids like quercetin. Um, quercetin on its own has been recommended as a supplement use for COVID because quercetin can aid in the ability of zinc to get into your cells, and zinc inhibits the viral replication process. So zinc is like a bodyguard that says, even though the virus is in your body, it's not getting in these cells, which means your viral load never gets really high and doesn't become an issue. Um, so the quercetin um, is really supportive in that mechanism and also for seasonal allergies. Um, it can help with like histamine and, you know, hay fever and all that stuff. Um, so the Bio-C Plus, the vitamin D balance blend, and then I think I would go to cellular antiox. Um, cellular antiox is also an antioxidant blend, um, but instead of vitamin C, it's using the highest um, potent antioxidants, which is cysteine and glutathione. Um, glutathione is the highest antioxidant in the spectrum that's available for the body to use. Um, glutathione has been shown in research I mentioned way earlier um, where we've seen more complications and shortness of breath and respiratory influence in individuals that don't have glutathione. We've also seen glutathione used as a nebulizer treatment, um, and we're seeing glutathione IV trips being used in combination treatment. Um, and so this is really important for two reasons, both because of the respiratory function, the respiratory virus, and um, the support on your respiratory health, which might be hindered mechanically or barrier speaking, but also that antioxidant capacity. And then you're getting beyond that glutathione and NAC work to support detoxification. So it's aiding in the way that your liver and kidneys and body is able to get rid of any potential environmental toxin like potential disinfectant hazards. Um, and then NAC, the other ingredient in there is an anticoagulant. So it stops the clotting factor, which is part of the process of the disease. Um, it also works as an expectorant to break up mucus and phlegm. It inhibits viral replication as well. So that's a pretty powerful player, I'd say for sure. Um, and uh, it's my husband's favorite. We just did a podcast episode with all the people on our team. And my husband will be like, if I ever see him doing something crazy in the house, he'll be like, oh, sorry, babe, I took an extra cellular antiox. <laughs> He's like hyper hypo. Like he like gets in this really, I get a kind of energetic influence. I take it at rise in the day, but he like really feels it. So I don't know. Maybe he needs more antioxidant. Um, that'd be the fourth one uh, or third one. The fourth one I would say would have to be multi-defense, um, which I mentioned earlier. That's my multivitamin that has minerals, uh, methylated B vitamins, and also that polyphenol blend to get your ORAC score, your antioxidant capacity up. 
Um, a probiotic would be really important too. Um, so I would start probably with my Restore Baseline probiotic, and you can use that to do the probiotic challenge. Um, I can link that in the notes as well, so you can determine where your microbiome status is at, and if that's enough, or if you have to level up higher. Um, but again, the probiotics, are gonna help both your innate and acquired immune system. So both if you were infected to not allow it to become severe, but also helping your body to learn it. And also what's cool about the probiotic is this works as nat nature's Prozac. Um, we've actually seen in clinical research that a combination of lactobacillus and bifido strains, which is the combo in this formula, can help um, as effective as Prozac in a double-blind placebo trial. Um, and so really fantastic to see clinical outcomes of the microbiome, which manufactures 80, 90% of your serotonin. So the probiotic can help as a mood stabilizer, a bowel regulator and digestive supporter for healthy bowel movements daily, and also that immune system. So that'd be another kind of multiple. And that's why I have that as a food goal as well, um, getting a cultured food in daily. A lot of bang for your buck, for sure. Yes. And then the last ones I would say for those of you that have anxiety, um, you know, so that, so multi-defense, the Restore Baseline Probiotic, Vitamin D Balance Blend, BioC Plus, and Cellular Antioxid are like the big ones for, for the antioxidants and the immune and all that world. And then you may though prioritize based on the individual GABA Calm or Calm and Clear if you're someone that runs more anxious and this environmental change is kind of keying you up, you're noticing already interference in the way you breathe, in your sleep patterns, you're, you're feeling that proverbial elephant on the chest or dealing with anxiety and racing thoughts. Um, GABA Calm is a chewable tablet and GABA is the most powerful um, inhibitory or mellow or outer compound. Mm -hmm. It takes like the physiological tremor out. Um, it's like a calorie free glass of wine. So it could be a way to wind down in the evening, taking that like steam train valve out, um, but also could be a powerful tool. I was taking that every single time I went to the grocery store in the beginning of pandemic because it just felt uncomfortable to be in that space. It felt very, it, there was palpable anxiety, even though I didn't come in with it, you could just feel it. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that that's kind of how school is going to feel in the beginning. Yes. And so I'm thinking that that might be a, a powerful tool for teachers and kids. Um, yeah. It is safe for children. And so that might be something if you're, you're noticing that your child is showing and exhibiting behaviors of anxiety, um, be checking in with your teachers on that as well, but watch for things like, you know, pulling their hair out or sleep disturbances, picking at their skin or more fidgety behavior or just like a low apathetic mood. Um, you know, be really proactive on um, watching that. And the kids biotic, the probiotic chew could be a good tool there as well, giving that mood and immune support. Absolutely. Um, I have a favorite and I think somebody here in the comments or the question box has asked about and they said calm and regulate, but I think I think you mean relax and regulate. That's my like and calm and clear. <laughs> Those are two I different, yeah. Calm, yeah, calm and clear, relax and regulate. But they're asking, I think they're they're talking about the relax and regulate because she or he is asking if you take it at night, can you still take the, the melatonin? Can you take them in conjunction? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the relax and regulate is magnesium bisglycinate and inositol. Those are the two ingredients in that. Love that. Um, Inositol has really fantastic influence on metabolic health. It can help to regulate your insulin response. It has favorable influence on cholesterol levels, reducing LDL, increasing HDL. Um, inositol is anxiolytic or anxiety reducing as well, and it helps with sleep. Um, we see individuals that have insomnia tend to have lower levels of inositol. Um, so that's one of the, and then, and then it has huge influence in the world of PCOS and hormone management. Um, so, so that's a part of it. And then the magnesium bisglycinate, that's the type of magnesium that you'd want to look for if you're doing a magnesium supplement, not the cheapo. So there is a product called Calm, which is like your powdered magnesium from like Walgreens or, or Target or whatever. Yeah. And that's just magnesium oxide and citrate. So that creates an osmotic or a water reaction in the body. It's only the magnesium bisglycinate that actually crosses the blood brain barrier. And that actually blocks your brain from stimulating your adrenals so that you aren't putting out that cortisol to wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, and it can help to manage that stress response. It also aids as a neuromuscular relaxer. So it can like disengage the tension that you have in your shoulder, or your neck, or clenching in your jaw at night. And, and it allows this kind of deep release in the body. 
Um, but the melatonin has a different mechanism. And um, I wasn't taking the sleep support until February of this year. And now I'm taking at least one, which is just 1.5 milligrams of melatonin. And that's what's been my sweet spot. One of the sleep support and a scoop of relax and regulate. Okay. And I'm sleeping like a baby. Yeah. I'm up to two scoops. I, I, I love that relax and regulate. It's, it's so good. It's I know. Good. I need like the bulk tub size. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, the same size as your grass-fed whey. Yeah, just give me a relax and regular. <laughs> Which we'll is another good it. one that you mentioned before, which I love too, your, the grass-fed whey, your um, whey protein mm -hmm. powder. Love it. Yeah. Great. Oh, good. Good. And like I said, that's a great tool for all ages, um, especially the kiddos that you're trying to get their protein quota up. Um, I think smoothies for school lunches is a great option to throw in the rotation. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And for our, for our breakfast on the road, coming into school, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, well, any other big questions that jumped up? No, that we, okay. we kind of got them as, as they've come in. And I think, let me double check. Nope. And we've got everything over in the, the chat area. So awesome. We're good. Okay. Well, thanks so much, you guys, for tuning in. Thank you, Lindy, for being an awesome moderator. And, um, so very much helping me out. Awesome. All of this amazing information is going to be so helpful. And I just can't, I can't thank you enough. I think this is an amazing platform and amazing thing that you're doing for teachers and for parents. And uh, on the daily, you help me kind of bring the calm, give me focus. And I, I really appreciate all your work. Really thank do. you. Thank you. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. I will follow up for those of you that are registered with um, the links and information. And I'll probably also put it up on the blog so everyone can access. And then I'll put this video up on YouTube. So if you liked it and you thought it was helpful, you can share that link with any family members or um, other teacher friends, parent friends. And um, I'm always here to be a support for you guys to feel empowered mm -hmm. and know that your body is capable and resilient and that you can take it to the next level with every decision of what you put on your fork. Um, so I am always thrilled and honored to be a part of your journey. If you want more and you want like a really tight program approach, um, check out my 12 week virtual food is medicine ketosis class, which starts September 9th. Um, and if you just want a little baby jump start, check out the anti-anxiety diet cookbook, which is behind me. This is a really good, like ease into the situation and it has 80 plus recipes and a two week meal plan. So a great way also to kind of just put it all together for you. And if I can do another plug for you, yeah, I love your podcast. So as teachers, while we're doing jobs here and there, washing the dishes at night, I love just to put, put in my headphones, listen to your podcast. Um, a couple of great episodes that I think would be really great to kind of jump in on that 202, I really think is a great beginner kind of course, get in, into yeah. the thing of it. But also 179 and 180 were really kind of that when the pandemic started and a lot of these same recommendations that you're talking about yeah. here, they're, they're mirrored in, in, you know, a bigger, longer scope as far as a conversation between you and Becky. So a nerdier um, and more research. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I, I love that kind of stuff. Great. So yeah. Awesome. And then I think another one was 192 keeping our kids safe is another yeah. thing we go into. So great, great resources. Thank you so much for everything you do. And teachers, we've got this. We've got yes. this. Yes. Awesome. Well, we appreciate all of you as parents to teachers and all that you invest into our children, our future, right? And um, I think we can all have a successful year and, um, you know, be proactive, apply critical thinking, and um, it's a synergistic relationship. So everything you put out is going to really have a trickle effect on the way that the year goes. So I think we, we can all do this together. Absolutely. All right. Y'all take care. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Molly.